Thomas Munzer. Munzer was born in 1488 or 1489 of fairly well-to-do parents and received a theological education. He led a restless life, changing work several times a year, he was at various times teacher, preacher, and chaplain. Finally in 1520, he was appointed preacher in Tvikau, where he met the so-called Tvikau prophets. The sermons of Storch had a lifelong impact on him. The notion of the possibility of direct communication with God, which was held to be far more important than the letter of the scriptures, the condemnation of priests and monks, of the rich and the noble, the belief in the coming of the kingdom of God on earth and in the imminent reign of the elect these subjects formed the basis of Munzer's world outlook, in his sermons he supported Storch and attacked the monks and other preachers. Disorders began in the town, and the authorities banished the prophets and Munzer. Munzer then transferred his activities to Prague. We note that he gravitated to the traditional seats of the Kiliastic movement first to Tvikau and then to the homeland of the Taborites. A sermon delivered by Munzer in Prague has been preserved. In it he asserts that after the death of the disciples of the Apostles, the Church, which had been pure, became a lecherous whore. The priests teach the external forms of the scriptures, which they steal from the Bible, quote, like thieves and murderers. End quote. He then proceeds to the core of his teaching his concept of the Church of the Chosen. Quote, Never will it happen, and for this glory to God, that priestlings and apes should represent God's Church, but the Chosen of God shall preach his word. To preach this doctrine I am ready to sacrifice my life. God has wrought miracles for his Chosen, especially in this country. For here a new Church will arise, and this people will be the mirror of the whole world. Therefore, I appeal to everyone to protect the word of God. If you fail to do this, God will give the Turks the force to annihilate you even in this year. End quote. Munzer's teaching did not meet with success in Prague, however, and he again took up a vagrant and hungry life. At last, in 1523, he was appointed preacher in the small town of Alstedt, and here he entered upon the first memorable phase of his career. Munzer rapidly gained influence in the town. He introduced the German language in the religious service, one of the first to do so in Germany, and he preached not only from the Gospel but from the Old Testament. Crowds of people flocked to his sermons, from Alstedt and from the neighboring towns and villages. The municipal officials ice wrote in a report, some of the local nobles have forbidden their subjects to attend the sermons here but the folk do not comply. They are thrown into jail and, when released, run hither again. Munzer grew ever bolder, calling the lords who had forbidden their people to attend his sermons big geese. He wrote to Zeiss, the power of the princes will come to an end and soon it will pass to the common folk. His attitude is characterized by the phrase, Whoever wants to become a building block in the new church ought to risk his neck or the builders will throw him away. Soon matters were out of hand. Instigated by Munzer, a mob burned down a chapel at Mullerbach, near Alstedt, which housed a miracle working image of the Virgin. When one of the participants in the riot was arrested, armed crowds of people appeared on the streets. More supporters arrived from the neighboring towns. Zeiss, who represented the Duke of Saxony, reported to the Duke that Munzer's preaching was at fault. He suggested that Munzer be summoned to court and banished if found guilty. Quote, Otherwise, his preaching, so popular with the simple folk, will cause us much toil and trouble. End quote. At this point, Luther, who had been disturbed by the actions and preaching of Munzer for some time, spoke out against him. He reproached Munzer for using the success of the Reformation to attack it. He concluded by challenging Munzer to a debate in Wittenberg. Munzer agreed to take part in the dispute only if the witnesses would be Turks, Romans, and pagans. At the same time, he printed two works in the neighboring town of Eilonberg, where he had his own print shop, called Protestation of Thomas Munzer, and Exposure of the Contrived Faith. These tracts bitterly attacked numerous aspects of Luther's teaching, as well as that of scholars and erudites who concoct false faith. Strangely, we still hear nothing about measures on the part of the authorities against Munzer, despite writings in which, for example, 
he characterized the Kerfirst of Saxony as, quote, a bearded fellow with less brains in his head than I've got in my behind. End quote. He also calls upon the inhabitants of the neighboring town of Sangerhausen to rise up against the authorities. In spite of such actions, Kerfirst Frederick of Saxony and his brother Johann themselves decided to listen to the renowned preacher on a trip through Alstedt. Munzer took this to be a sign of readiness on the part of the princes to become a tool in his hands and in their presence delivered a sermon in which he expounded his views openly. He attacked Luther, whom he called Brother Swine and Brother Sluggard, and attempted to win the princes to his cause. He told them that they were called upon to annihilate the foes of the true faith, the faith of the chosen who are guided by God. Quote, Dearest and beloved rulers, know your destiny from the mouth of God and do not let the boastful priests cheat you by imaginary patience and kindness. For the stone that has been cast down from the mountain not by hands has grown big. Poor peasants and laymen see it far better than you. End quote. The day of the last reckoning approaches, and, quote, oh, how gloriously will the Lord smash the old pots with an iron rod. End quote. In this terrible hour one can learn the true way and foresee the future by one means only, through dreams and revelation. Quote, this is in the true spirit of the apostles, the patriarchs, and the prophets to wait for visions and to trust in them. End quote. Munzer cites example after example from the Bible. The chief difficulty, however, is to distinguish whether a vision is from God or from the devil. For this, the princes ought to have faith in the new Daniel, the chosen man. Quote, Therefore, a new Daniel must rise and set forth revelation and must march at the head. End quote. Munzer urges relentless extermination of the enemies of the new teaching. Quote, For the godless have no right to live except when the chosen give their permission. If you want to be true rulers, drive out the enemy of Christ, for you are the instrument to achieve this end. Let the wicked who divert us from God live no longer. End quote. Quote, it was not in vain that God commanded through Moses, you are the holy people and must not pity the godless. Smash their altars, smash to pieces their idols and burn them, lest I be wrathful with you. End quote. At this point, Munzer's sermon begins to shade into threats. Just as food and drink provide the means of living, he asserts, so, Two, quote, is the sword needed for extermination of the godless. But for this to be done true, it must be done by our dear fathers, the princes, who profess Christ with us. But if they will not do it, their sword shall be taken away from them. End quote. Quote, if they fail to believe in God's words, they ought to be removed, as Paul saith, expel the depraved from amongst you. And if they behave in contrary fashion, kill them without mercy. Not only godless rulers, but priests and monks must be killed who call our holy gospel a heresy and claim to be the best Christians themselves. End quote. It is a perplexing episode. How could an insignificant preacher undertake to lecture and threaten the most important princes of the empire? Some consider this proof of Munzer's short-sightedness, for others it testifies to the prince's forbearance. Could there not be a more substantial explanation? Munzer was a force to be reckoned with at the time. We learn this from other sources from his letters and from the testimony presented before his execution. At the time of the sermon to the princes, he had organized a union, quote, for the protection of the gospel, and as a warning to the godless in Alstedt. He had some experience at such activities. While still a young man, Munzer had founded a secret union directed against the primate of Germany, Archbishop Ernst. But his new union was far larger in scope. At one gathering 300 new members were inducted, at another, 500. Furthermore, Munzer advised the citizens of neighboring towns to establish similar unions, reports were received that this plan was meeting with success. His contacts were very extensive, reaching even into Switzerland. Luther accused Munzer of, quote, sending to all countries messengers who fear light, end quote. In his letters, Munzer emphasized the purely defensive nature of the union, quote, against the oppressors of the gospel. 
end quote. But after being captured, he testified that he caused the disturbances with the aim that, quote, all Christians should become equal and the princes and lords reluctant to serve the gospel be driven out or put to death. End quote. The motto of the Allstadt Union was, Omnia sunt communia, everything is common. Everyone was to share with others, quote, as much as he could. End quote. And if a prince or a count refused to do so, quote, he was to be beheaded or hanged. End quote. Munzer's union can be seen as the realization of his doctrine of the supremacy of the chosen, as he calls the members of his union. The situation in Allstadt grew ever more explosive. The neighboring knight von Witzleben forbade his subjects to attend Munzer's sermons and dispersed a crowd of them, who nevertheless set out for Allstadt. Some of them fled to Allstadt and an order was sent for the fugitives to be returned to their lord. In a vehement sermon, Munzer called Witzleben an archbrigand and referred to his enemies as archjudices, saying that the princes were, quote, acting not only against the faith but against natural law, and that they must be killed like dogs. Crowds of local citizens and new arrivals filled the streets of Allstadt. The authorities lost all control over the town and could only appeal to Duke Johann of Saxony, who summoned Munzer to Weimar for questioning. The interrogation took place in the presence of the Duke and his counselors. Munzer denied having assailed the authorities and described his union as legal and purely defensive. Numerous witnesses, however, spoke against him. As a result, he was ordered to close his print shop, and the citizens of Allstadt were forbidden to form unions. A contemporary source describes how Munzer, pale and trembling after the inquest, came out and, in reply to a question by Zeiss, answered, It seems that I'll have to look for another state. But upon returning to Allstadt, Munzer took heart, refused to close the print shop and started writing protests. Ker first Frederick of Saxony intervened at this point and summoned Munzer to Weimar for the second time. At first Munzer surrounded himself with armed guards, apparently thinking to put up resistance, but in the night he climbed over the town wall and slipped away leaving behind a letter in which he said that he was going to a village but would be back soon. After his flight, Munzer wrote his compatriots another letter, calling for them to stand firm and be brave, he promised that he would be together with them soon, quote, to wash hands in the blood of tyrants. End quote. Munzer went next to Mulhausen, a town in central Germany. The choice was not accidental. For a year this place had been in a state of paralysis, without authority, and on the verge of rebellion. A contemporary account of what was called the Mulhausen Disturbances is extant. It describes the events prior to Munzer's arrival and his activities there. The disorders began with assaults on monasteries and churches. All the monasteries were robbed and religious objects in the churches smashed. The movement was headed by a fugitive monk, Heinrich Pfeiffer who urged in his sermons rejection of the authority of the municipal council. On July 3, 1523, the alarm was sounded. A crowd surrounded the town hall and shots were fired. The council was compelled to make concessions, which were set forth in 53 points. In particular, complete freedom of preaching was announced. The insurgents were headed by a council of eight which retained its power on a PAR with the municipal council even after the agreement. Dual authority ruled in the town people jailed by the municipal council were not infrequently released by the eight. The signing of the 53 points did not, however, pacify the town, in fact, it further aggravated the situation. Many priests' houses were robbed, leaflets were circulated telling that if the priests did not get out of town their houses would be burned. Priests who ventured into the streets were killed. Such was the situation in Mulhausen when Munzer appeared there on August 24, 1524. He joined with Pfeiffer and their activity together soon began to bear fruit. Within a month, the town was in an uproar. This time the insurgents' demands mirrored Munzer's ideas no authority to be obeyed, all taxes and levies to be abolished, priests to be exiled. The burgomaster and some councillors fled the town and appealed for support from the peasants of the neighbouring villages. At this time fires swept the villages, in all likelihood set by supporters of Munzer and Pfeiffer. 
but the peasants stood firm on the side of the council. Promises of support also came in from towns round about. The insurgents were forced to yield. The authority of the council was restored and Pfeiffer and Muntzer were banished from Mulhausen. Muntzer set off for Nuremberg, where he printed two of his works. One of these, an interpretation of the first chapter of St. Luke, had been written toward the end of his stay in Alstead and revised in Mulhausen. The other, Discourse for Defense, was written in reply to Luther. Shortly before, Luther had written his letter to the princes of Saxony against a rebellious spirit, in which he drew their attention to the dangerously aggressive character of Munzer's teaching. Quote, it begins to seem to me that they wish to destroy all authority so as to become the lords of the world. They say that they are led by the spirit. But this is an ill spirit, one which is manifested in the destruction of churches and monasteries. End quote. Quote, Christ and his apostles never destroyed a single temple nor smashed a single holy image. End quote. Let them preach, argues Luther, quote, but those are not good Christians who pass from words to fists. End quote. In his reply, Munzer brought down a veritable cascade of abuse on Luther. He called him a basilisk, a dragon, a viper, an archpagan, an archdevil, a bashful whore of Babylon and finally, in a fit of cannibalistic frenzy, he predicted that the devil would boil Luther in his own juice and devour him. Quote, I would like to smell your frying carcass. End quote. But Munzer's Nuremberg works are especially interesting in that they demonstrate his social ideas in their most mature form. His discourse for defense begins with a dedication to the serenest, first-born prince, the mighty Lord Jesus Christ, the gracious King of Kings, the mighty Duke of all the faithful. Here Munzer expresses one of his basic conceptions that power on this earth can belong only to God. The message ends with the following words, quote, The people will be free, and God will be the sole Lord over them. End quote. Princes had usurped power belonging to God. Quote, Why do you call them serene princes? This title belongs not to them but to Christ. End quote. And, quote, why do you call them highborn? I thought you were a Christian, but you are a pagan. End quote. Munzer had forgotten that only a few months before, he had looked to the princes for aid. Now he says, quote, princes are not lords, but servants of the sword. They must not do what they deem well but rather implement the truth. End quote. The role assigned to the princes was no more than that of executioner. It was not for nothing that Paul said dot that princes were not for the good but for the wicked. However, in Munzer's view, they fail to fulfill even this function. Quote, those who ought to set an example for Christians, to which end they bear the name of princes, prove to the highest degree by all their deeds their unfaith. End quote. Quote, their hearts are vain and, therefore, all these mighty and arrogant godless ones must be thrown down from their throne. God gave the princes and lords to men in his wrath and in his bitterness he will destroy them. End quote. Munzer also does not recall that shortly before, he saw in poverty and suffering a cross sent from above. Now the call to oppose the oppressors becomes one of the chief themes in his teaching, quote, The very stuff of usury, theft, and robbery are our lords made of. Fish in the water birds in the air, the fruits of the earth they want to take everything. And beyond that they order that God's word be preached to the poor thus, God has commanded you not to steal, and if a poor man takes the smallest thing, then he is hanged and Dr. Liar says, Amen. The lords are themselves guilty of making the poor their foe. They do not wish to remove the cause of the indignation. How can the matter be set right? Since I speak so, perhaps I, too, rebel well, so be it. End quote. By all their misdeeds the princes have deprived themselves of the right to the sword. Quote, At the solicitation of the chosen, God will no longer tolerate suffering. End quote. In actuality, the power of God on earth is pictured as the power of the chosen, who are conceived of as a narrow, closed union. Quote, it would be a wondrous church in which the chosen would be separated from the godless. End quote. 
the chosen receive God's behests directly, by which means they execute his will on earth. In various periods of his life, Munzer asserted that he himself communicated directly with God. From Nuremberg, Munzer set off for Switzerland and the borderlands of Germany, where the peasant war was already raging. While his role of agitator seems to have met with success, he did not stay long in the area. Seidmann, the author of one of the most complete biographies of Munzer, suggests that since disturbances had already broken out, Munzer feared that he would be unable to gain an important enough place for himself. In February 15, 25, Munzer returned to Mulhausen. By this time, the peasant rebellion was already spreading from the south into central Germany, toward the town of Mulhausen. Authority had begun to slip from the hands of the municipal council. The eight demanded the keys to the city gates and the council had to comply. Anyone who disagreed with Munzer and Pfeiffer's party was under constant threats of being banished. Monasteries and churches were robbed, sacred objects destroyed and monks and nuns assaulted. Finally, all Catholic clergy were driven from the town. The sermons of Munzer and Pfeiffer revolved around the ideas outlined earlier, princes and lords have no right to their power, authority must pass to the society of the chosen, men have been created equal by nature and so must be equal in life, all who do not comply must be put to the sword. They preached that the rich cannot attain salvation, whoever loves beautiful chambers, rich ornaments and, above all, money cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Finally, after the council refused to admit Munzer and Pfeiffer into their number, it was decided at a huge gathering that the council be dismissed. A new so-called Eternal Council was elected. The History of Thomas Munzer, a contemporary account long attributed to Melanchthon, describes the situation as follows. This was the beginning of the new kingdom of Christ. First of all, they drove out all monks, took over the monasteries and all their property. There was a monastery of Johann Knights with large holdings, it was taken over by Thomas. And in order to take part in all proceedings, he came to the council and announced that all resolutions must be taken in accordance with God's revelation and on the basis of the Bible. And so whatever he liked was deemed just an especial commandment of God. He also taught that all property must be common, as it is written in the Acts of the Apostles. With this he so affected the folk that no one wanted to work, but when anyone needed food or clothing he went to a rich man and demanded it of him in Christ's name, for Christ had commanded that all should share with the needy and what was not given freely was taken by force. Many acted thus, including those who lived with Thomas in the Johann Knight Monastery. Thomas instigated this brigandage and multiplied it every day and threatened all the princes. According to the same document, Munzer's teaching included the destruction of authority and the communality of property, quote, according to the requirements of Christian love, no one ought to be superior to another all must be free and there must be communality of all property. End quote. Luther wrote that Munzer had become a king and sovereign ruling in Mulhausen. Arms were produced in the town, the citizens given military training, and mercenaries, landskinets, were hired. By this time, the peasant rebellion had enveloped all the neighboring areas. Large groups of Mulhausen citizens and inhabitants of nearby villages assaulted castles round about. These they robbed, burned, or destroyed. Munzer ordered that all castles and houses of nobility be destroyed and razed to the ground. Special arson units were organized. Booty was carried off to the town by the cart load. Munzer sent out messengers and issued detailed instructions on the torture of apparent villains apprehended and the destruction of monasteries and castles. He called on other towns to join the uprising. Here is what he wrote to the citizens of Alstedt. Dear brethren, will you sleep even now? The time is ripe. All German, French, and Italian lands have risen. Be there only three of you, but if you put your hope in the name of God fear not a hundred thousand. Forward, forward, forward. It is high time. Let not kind words of these Esau's arouse you to mercy. Look not upon the sufferings of the godless. They will entreat you touchingly begging you like children. Let not mercy seize your soul, as God commanded to Moses, he has revealed to us the same. 
forward, forward, while the iron is hot. Let your swords be ever warm with blood. Though not all German, French and Italian lands had risen, the whole of central Germany Thuringia, Saxony and Hessen was in rebellion. Toward the beginning of May 15, 25, the princes began to gather in force. A major part here was played by Luther's communication on disorderly and murderous peasant gangs. By mid-May, two armies began to assemble in the environs of Frankenhausen. They were of approximately equal size about 8,000 men each. Muntze rode out at the head of his army, surrounded by 300 bodyguards and holding aloft a naked sword, which symbolized the goal of the rebels' annihilation of the godless. Some nobles had joined his camp. Muntze wrote to others, threatening them and urging them to ally themselves with him. He wrote to Count Ernst Mansfeld, quote, So that you know that we have the power to command, I speak. The Eternal, living God hath commanded that you be thrown off the throne and hath given to us the might to accomplish this. It is about you and those like you that God saith, your nest must be torn down and trodden underfoot. End quote. The letter ends with the words, I am marching after. Munzer with Gideon's sword. Nevertheless, panic began to spread through Munzer's army. There were attempts at negotiating with the enemy and executions of those suspected of treason took place. Munzer sought to encourage his followers, quote, Sooner will the nature of the earth or of heaven be changed than God desert us. End quote. He promised that he would catch bullets in his sleeves. But when the first shots were fired, the rebel army broke and ran. Thousands of them were slaughtered on the field of battle. In his hour of defeat, Munzer with Gideon's sword lost all presence of mind. He is the first of a long list of revolutionary leaders to act in this fashion. Munza ran for the city, found an empty house and got into bed, feigning illness. A looting soldier came upon a packet of letters addressed to Munzer that the latter had dropped in his haste, and Munzer was seized. At the inquest, when asked about a certain execution of four men, Munzer replied, quote, It was not I who executed them, my dear brothers, but God's truth. End quote. Munzer was subjected to torture, and when he cried out, the interrogator told him that those who had perished because of him had suffered worse. Munzer burst out laughing and replied, they wished for no different themselves. He was sent to the castle of the very Count Mansfeld to whom he had written, I am marching after. Munzer confessed everything and betrayed the names of his comrades in the secret union. Before his execution, he wrote a letter to the citizens of Mulhausen, appealing to them not to rebel against authority, according to Christ's commandment. Quote, I wish to say in my farewell address, so as to unburden my soul, that you should avoid riot, lest innocent blood be shed in vain. Help my wife if you can, and especially avoid bloodshed, of which I warn you sincerely. End quote. Munzer took communion and died as a son of the Catholic Church. His head was put on a stake for show. Contemporaries considered Munzer to be the central figure in the peasant war. Luther and Melanchthon believed him to be its most dangerous leader. Sebastian Frank referred to the war as the Munzer Uprising, and Duke George of Saxony wrote that with Munzer's execution the war could be considered finished. This appreciation of Munzer's role, however, could hardly have been meant to describe his activities as organizer, rather, the commentators most likely had in mind his function as the originator of an ideology of hatred and destruction. Luther must have been thinking along these lines when he wrote to Hans Rugel, whoever has seen Munzer can say that he has seen the devil in the flesh, at his most ferocious.